So you and I have been chatting about this recently published paper in the BMJ about fish oil and cardiovascular disease. What do you think about it? Mm -hmm. So this paper just came out actually last month, 2024. Um, they're looking at regular fish oil supplements and course of cardiovascular diseases, a prospective cohort study. Um, all right, background on this paper. Uh, as you point out, it's massive. This is a almost 12 year investigation. This comes from the UK Biobank, which is almost a half a million participants. It's actually an extraordinary data set. So in this study, these guys looked at individuals who at their baseline intake checked the box that they are in fact taking fish oil supplements. That's it. So they took those of this almost half million uh, group, there's about 130,000 that reported at their baseline, they were taking fish oil. There's no blood measurements, people. We have no idea what's going on. We don't know whether they're still taking it. We know nothing about the fish oil uh, products that they were purchasing. Was it something that they bought down at the gas station or, you know, did their physician prescribe it? Uh, did they take it for two weeks or did they take it for many, many years? We know nothing about that, just that they checked a box that they were. Um, two papers, actually, two B&J papers have come out, but this one that you're referencing, Tish, that really caught our attention, said that the regular use of fish oil, because that's the box that they checked, that was the question, um, might be a risk factor for AFib and stroke. So in this 130,000 co person cohort, they found a you know, modest increased potential to develop stroke. And these guys were healthy and that they defined healthy as the absence of cardiovascular disease and the absence of care, uh, cancer. So we can't really say that they were healthy. They just didn't have cardiovascular disease or cancer. Uh, so of this population, um, I think that there was a 13% chance of developing AFib um, or a 5% chance of going on to have a stroke as compared to the population that did not check the supplementing with fish oil box. Um, however, from the same cohort, from the same 130,000, we have a study that was published in 2020 actually showing uh, that fish oil, so these same box checkers uh, had lower risk of all cause um, mortality and cardiovascular disease mortality. Uh, as compared to the cohort that didn't check the box. So we've got two potentially conflicting pieces of information, um, but I'm not sure how much we can actually extrapolate to your point, uh, you know, your wild exclam exclamation, how can BMJ even publish papers, you know, using the whole weight of the evidence on a checked box? What yeah. Yeah. And as you said, we, we know nothing about the frequency of use, the dosage, the reason for use, the polypharmacy. We know nothing about this. It was simply right. a, the quality of product, the exactly. duration. Yeah. All of it. Nothing, nothing. No. So they check the box and in this, they're going to live longer, but there's just, you know, they're, they're going to, they're not going to have cardiovascular disease, but they might develop, you know, AFib, they might have a stroke. Anyway, it's a little bit muddy. And I should say all of the risks or benefits associated with check the, the checkbox cohort are very, are very modest. Um, so I think that this is a commentary, these two papers um, is a commentary just on, 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 on nutrition research. And, you know, I think it's really kind of disappointing. I mean, it would have been fabulous if they'd gotten a couple of blood tests that was specimen in there. And we could actually look at, you know, the red blood cell quantity. We could look at the omega in index. So that's the amount of omega of, of omega threes present in the red blood cell membrane, which has been associated with um, you know, benefit or disease. If you, you know, benefit if you're at 8% or above EPA, DHA or disease when you're below that. Uh, in many, many good solid research studies, but they don't have any, um, but they didn't collect any biomarker data uh, of this nature, as far as I'm aware in this population. So if we look at another study, and this is another massive study. So this is a, this is out of, um, this is looking at a Danish cohort of almost 60,000 individuals. And they act, and they did, take adipose uh, biopsies, which is considered to be one of the best measures of 
fatty acids of of physical omega three fatty acid status, and it's a long term measure of uh, fatty acid status. So they took these adipose biopsies. I can't say I would really want to volunteer for that, but this public this particular publication. Uh, is really interesting. And this is called, uh, this was published in 2021, Omega-3 Fatty Acids in Adipose Tissue and Risk of AFib. Uh, and this is Ricks et al. Uh, and this is from the Danish Diet Cancer and Health Cohort. Uh, again, almost 60,000 individuals. By the way, we'll link to all of these, um, you know, wherever we, we post this. So these guys had, you know, an impressive protective benefit when they had higher EPA specifically in the adipose. Higher EPA was associated with a protective benefit. Um, in women only, DHA was also associated with protective benefit. So this was looking at the highest versus the lowest uh, quintile. So those who were eating the most fish had the lowest incidence of AFib, both men and women when looking at EPA, women only when looking at DHA. But a but but you know, fish consumption was definitely associated with a benefit. Uh, and to your point earlier, they did a pretty nice job in uh, identifying that these people were consuming fish. I'll actually defer to you for comments on how they collected their data and whether they included supplements. Yeah. So in this study, as you're getting at, you know, they used the, the fish, not the fish oil supplements, and they had uh, food frequency questionnaires. And interesting about this is they also did collect information about fish oil supplements, but they deemed them not important or not worthy of study because they didn't know about the quality. They didn't know about why they were taking it, the dosage, the very things that yeah. the BMJ studies yeah. are hanging their hats on. Right, right, right. It was also a very interesting thing about this study. Yeah, well, and then they got adipose biopsies. I think that's mm -hmm. incredibly impressive. So we can definitely, I think we can say here very strongly that eating fish, and I would argue clean source, you know, fatty fish is amazing and it's and protective. Um, the UK biobank studies are a little bit sketchy. Um, they would not change how I practice. Uh, but I will say that we've got these larger, you know, pharma has is making fish oil, uh, as many people know, Loveza being one of them. Um, these are high dose EPA DHA concentrates. So, so these are, you know, somewhat molecularly altered. They're not like eating the whole fish um, so that they can really concentrate it deeply. And they're, you know, and they're really high dose. And now we've got these large cohorts taking these, um, EPA DHA concentrates out. And I want to say across the board, even when you hear that these uh, high dose EPA DHA concentrates don't have benefit, they're looking at something called a composite endpoint. So they're looking at a bunch of different variables all lumped together. So stroke, cardio, you know, specific cardiovascular disease, sudden cardiac death, et cetera, et cetera. They'll just lump a bunch of those things together. And if that endpoint, that composite endpoint uh, changes, they'll report on that. If it, if, if they see no, no shift and if even early in the study, studies goes on, go on for years, but they'll shut a study down if they don't see any beneficial change early on in these composite endpoints. Uh, but it's disappointing when you use something that, you know, comes from nature like this, even though it has been somewhat altered to increase the concentration and, um, you know, decide that it's not beneficial when you put it through the lens of a composite endpoint, which is a very kind of a drug-based idea, a way of looking at it. So go in and tease out those endpoints, tease out uh, heart attacks, uh, coronary heart disease events, you know, stroke, et cetera, et cetera. And you can see really pretty cool benefit um, in fact, talking about uh, one study, the vital study, and this was a modest amount, this was only 840 milligrams of an EPA DHA product. Um, there was a 28% reduced risk for heart attacks, 50% reduced risk for fatal heart attacks, 17% 17 reduced risk for coronary heart disease events in general. And what's mind blowing is that in this cohort, there was, when they, when they just looked at uh, African Americans, there was a 77% uh, reduction in heart attacks in Afri in the African American cohort. 
and it was not a small cohort. So this particular vital, this the vital study was designed, you know, with, with sufficiently powered with women, sufficiently powered with African Americans. Um, I think it was, you know, it was a decent study, and they showed some pretty extraordinary outcome. However, you know, that said, when we look at some other trials. Um, there was a meta-analysis published in 2021, again, looking at these pharma studies, higher doses, um, there is, in some cases, an increased incidence of AFib. So going back to that UK biobank study that I'm just, I, 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 I don't think it's really worth its weight, um, at least that analysis. Those, there'll be other studies coming out from that data that will, will certainly be compelling. Um, but we do see in some of these large pharma trials an incredibly slight increased incidence uh, in AFib, uh, but it does in some cases reach significance. So, you know, a, another large pharma trial, the Reduce It showed, um, you know, an itty bitty but significant increased risk in AFib. I think the OMEMI uh, may have also shown that as well. When you look, however, at the incidence of AFib, it's really, really low. So 2.65% uh, in the treatment group versus 1.94 in the placebo group. So that means less than 1% of the study population will actually be affected with AFib. And when you look at who's effective in these larger pharma studies, it's older individuals who are on many different medications, including blood thinners, or have an established cardiovascular disease history. Uh, and then layered onto that are these high dose fish oil supplements. So that's the population. Um, so we see food as a benefit in the Danish study. Uh, the biobank study, I think we're just gonna hold on, but we do see in these high concentrated farm pharma interventions in, vul in a very vulnerable population, there's a slight increased risk. So what would you say, Kara, what would you define, you said you were saying in these in these pharma studies, what, what are you uh, saying at high dose? Yeah, How they're doing, like okay, so so the, the, the vital was not, the vital was only, was less than a gram per day, um, but some of these others are, are up to 4,000 milligrams. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, yeah, it's definitely high dose. Okay, and you know, I'm sure your audience would always like to know kind of with all the information you get, your current thinking and your, so what would be your mm -hmm. recommendation for, let's say the lay person and fish oil and, and then anything else? That yeah, you pulling all this. So pulling this information together, um, especially the pharma studies, because they're, because, because they're what I would consider therapeutic amounts, four grams is, is something that I'm going to prescribe in inflammatory conditions sometimes, or in that neighborhood, maybe three grams, uh, two and a half, three grams. Um, I was excited to have these studies come out because they were going to be the first larger ones. I would say that um, my thinking has changed a little bit. Uh, I would be mindful around using a high dose fish oil concentrate in a older individual with established cardiovascular disease on multiple medications. I might be, I would be a little bit more mindful. Um, however, I would, I would absolutely recommend fatty fish. So I might do a lower dose supplementation in this population and then uh, add in fatty fish because I do, going back to that, the, you know, the omega index, this is looking at the red blood cell levels of um, EPA and DHA. We need to be at about 8% or higher to really have that beneficial effect. And I test fatty acids in my patients all the time. So the omega-3 index, looking at red blood cell status of, of our omega-3s, we want to be at, at least 8%, probably better at around 10%. I want my all of my population to be there. Um, I may do it in the vulnerable population with a more food-based approach. Actually, I'll do it with everybody with as much of a food-based approach as possible, as long as we can get clean source fish. Um, but I'm not shying away from using fish oil supplementations in my practice. I am not. Perfect. Well, thanks for, thanks for the chat. <laughs> Thank you. All right, we did it. I got to go, girl. I got to be on another. <laughs>